Uh, good evening, everyone, to tonight's episode of Profound States uh, with your usual guest, Mike Beaver, Char uh, Charles Michael Beaver. I go by Mike. Uh, you can't see my eyes. So, um, My guest tonight is Jim Willis. He's written, uh, he's an author and experiencer of various different things. And let me just read his bio to get started. And I am reading. He's a theologian, historian, musician, uh, has a bachelor's degree um, from the East, East Man School of Music and his master's degree from Andover Newton Theological School. Ooh, an ordained minister, wow. For over 30, 40 years, he served as an adjunct college professor and guest lecturer in comparative religion, cross-cultural studies, and contemporary spirituality. His background led to his writing more than 20 books on religion, the apocalypse, spirituality, and arcane or buried cultures, specializing in research, bridging lost civilizations, suppressed history, and the study of earth energy, dowsing, and out-of-body experiences. Welcome to tonight's episode of Found States, Jim Willis. Oh, Mike, when you start talking about all those years, it makes me feel old. <laughs> well, uh, Don't know where it's gone. If you're not, uh, you're, since you're not a lady, I can go ahead and ask you, what year were you born? I was born in 1946. Wow, coming, you, you look younger yeah. than me. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. But this coming April, I'll be 77 years old. And wow, matter of fact, look anywhere uh, near your age. I'm even uh, I'm even planning on a bit of a a road trip to go back and visit some haunts if, of my past, so to speak. I, I, <laughs> I want to know your diet. <laughs> I want to look as good as you when I'm 77, oh, well. right? Uh, 77. I'll be, I'm 76. Yeah, I'll be 77 in April and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, feeling every bit of it right now. <laughs> it's been, a, been quite a winter. Well, I'm going to have to take my glasses off because people can't see my eyes with this reflection, but I guess it, it's okay. Um, so uh, if you hear a, an angry woman in the background, that's my wife. Oh. <laughs> So anyway, um, if let's say you weren't Jim Willis, but you had some idea about yourself, but not as much knowledge as you have, and you went into a bookstore and you saw all of your, how many books have you got? 20? Well, I, I think there are 19 out now, but the 20th is coming out. Uh, well, it, the 20th officially is coming out in March. Um, it's a book called American Cults, published by Visible Inc., and uh, it's already up on Amazon, but the uh, the public the publication isn't out yet. On the other hand, uh, I've also got um, a book that we uh, have been working on called Sabuco and Me. Sabuco is my spirit guide, and uh, my daughter Jen, who is my um, publicist colleague technician guru and general consultant <laughs> is is uh, in the process of uh, working on that and I'm working on the I'm about halfway through the uh, audio book now and then we have another one coming out which is a kind of a I don't know what to call it it it, it it's a memoir but it's also kind of an autobiography the publisher who's doing it uh, uh, contacted me and he wanted a book uh, about spiritual seeking and spiritual seekers, but he wanted it against the last uh, oh seven decades of American history. It, it history never divides up as e as evenly as we would like it to. But basically, since the fifties, uh, uh, at least, which is I'm familiar with, having been born in forty six, um, each decade, the fifties, the sixties, the seventies, eighties, and right up to the present has seemed to feature a, a major theme that has changed uh, with each passing decade. And as they meld together, you realize that uh, seeking after a spiritual life in each of those decades involves a different, a different mindset, 
uh, people thought differently in the 50s. They thought differently in the 60s and in the 70s and right down to the present. And so he contacted me and wanted to know if I would do uh, a book written uh, decade by decade, so to speak, and uh, talk a little about what it took to seek real, true spirituality during each of those decades, given the uh, ambiance of the time, so to speak. And uh, I, I guess since I'm <laughs> since I've been around for seven of those decades, he thought of me. And so uh, that book is coming out. I expect to see the galleys for it by the end of the month, he said. So I expect that should be out this spring, too. It's a uh, the tentative title that we're working with right now is Gather Ye Wisdom While Ye May, based on the poem Gather Ye Roses or, or uh, While Ye May. And uh, so that's, I, I guess that's going to make 20... I don't know, 22 or 23 or something like that. Well, if you walked into, I'll finish this question. So if you walked into a bookstore right now and you saw all of your books that have already been published sitting on your, on the bookshelf and you're the, like, um, an average Joe mm -hmm. or uh, Josephine walking in that bookstore and you just looked at all these books and you really didn't know that didn't know the knowledge you have that's in the books, mm -hmm. but you just looked at the covers and you're like, wow, there's, there's the Kashik field. That one looks interesting. That's probably would, the one would, that I'd pick. <laughs> would that be the one that you yeah, the quant most people would pick? A quantum Akashic field. I think uh, it's certainly selling um, as well or better than any of the rest of them. Uh, it's, it's a guide to out of body experiences for the astral traveler, which sounds a little bit pretentious, but the reason I'm so excited about it is because it's uh, most of my books involve a lot of uh, journalistic scholarship. Uh, I'm uh, in touch, for instance, with people like Andrew Collins, who's uh, more on the on the ground or uh, Graham Hancock, who uh, actually is boots on the ground when it comes out to looking at past civilizations. And being a college professor, a lot of my books have a lot of academic um, overtones to them in the, in, in the sense of forgotten, forgotten scholarship or forgotten civilizations or lost civilizations. But the quantum Akashic field is something quite different. Uh, when, when a minister who's, you know, a guy who's met a minister, a Christian minister for 40 years, starts talking about out-of-body out of experiences, you know that something has happened. And uh, with me, that began about 15 years ago. And uh, it's it's still going on, and it to me, that's the one that probably holds out most hope for the human race because we live in a pretty materialistic society and uh, a pretty divided society. And the quantum akashic field, uh, the book that I wrote uh, about out of body experiences carries us beyond that. And frankly, I think it carries us to a place we need to be because if we don't respond to the reality of, of who we are, and I think that involves uh, the Akashic field and, and quantum reality, if we don't respond to that and get away from this path we're on, uh, it seems to me that we're in line to become the next lost civilization. So I... Uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited about the possibilities of traveling beyond where we are right now as a human race. And that's, that's the book that I would probably recommend if anybody wanted to find out a little more about who I am. So do you remember the very first time you got out of your body? Yes, I do. And did it scare you? Does it, how did it happen? And tell us that. Well, it, it's, it was kind of a while in coming. Um, I guess I better give you a little bit of background. Uh, even though I've been a, a Christian minister for 40 years, um, I was becoming very dissatisfied with the uh, the way the Christian church was moving nowadays and the direction it was moving in. And the church wasn't the same. Uh, and I, I've discovered that there's a vast difference between the word religion and spirituality. Uh, I think spirituality is a word that unites. Religion can be, especially nowadays, a word that divides. Um, and when I retired 
from Christian ministry, uh, it, it was I had a mission in mind, uh, a goal. Uh, I retired back in uh, when I was 62 years old. I was I retired a little early because I just felt I couldn't wait anymore. Uh, when I went into ministry back in oh late well early very early 70s, um, I had the idea like most of us did back then that you become pastor of a church and what you're doing is joining a community of uh, people who were seeking spiritual growth. And you have the idea that you're going to be into this community that's going to support each other and and want to expand their knowledge of who God is and who we are and what the world is all about. It, it isn't that way. It doesn't turn out that way at all. Uh, it, it was a very kind of a disappointing thing to learn f for me that a church is kind of like any other uh, business organization. The pastor is kind of a CEO of sorts, and he has money raising responsibilities, and he has business responsibilities, and he has to take care of the physical plant. And he's a counselor, and he has to uh, sit with people and listen to them and talk to them. And uh, he has to plan this meeting and that meeting and all the rest of the things together. And what happens after a while is that the years go by and you realize, especially when you uh, add a, a, the responsibilities of being a college professor in comparative religion, you're spending most of your time talking about God or talking about spirituality. And you're just not experiencing it. You don't have time. You get caught up in this materialistic, busy, loud, fast world that we live in. And so when I got to the age of 62 and I was thinking about retiring, I had a goal in mind. I, I wanted to come out and live in the woods for a year. Uh, and that was my goal. I, I wanted to live there for a year and I wanted to experience the holy. I wanted to experience spirituality. I had a uh, even a, a Bible verse in mind. It comes from the Old Testament book of Genesis. Um, Enoch and, I mean, not Enoch, but uh, Jacob and Esau, two brothers, uh, were had a, had a quarrel and a falling out, and uh, Jacob was forced to flee for his life. And uh, while there, he married the four women who eventually became the mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel, and eventually his name was changed to uh, Israel from Jacob. And it happened in an interesting way. Uh, he had come back down from down the Fertile Crescent from uh, probably up in Turkey where he was spending his time. And he was about to be reconciled with his brother uh, Esau. And uh, the day before, the night before he was to be reconciled, he was on one side of the river with his family, his small family army. Esau was on the other side. And uh, it says that you know, Jacob was up walking around, wondering what was going to happen on the day. He didn't know how his brother was going to receive him, and he was worried. He was nervous. And all of a sudden, the Bible says a, a man appeared to him, and they began to wrestle. Why? I don't know. But they wrestled all night long. And uh, eventually, as dawn became uh, apparent over the horizon, the Bible says that uh, Jacob realized he was wrestling with God. And he said the words, I will not let you go until you bless me. And that was what was on my mind when I came up here to live one year in the woods after my retirement. I had not planned for retirement. I didn't know what I was going to do. But I found this, this place, I, as it turns out, I was guided here to this place where I live right now. And I had that verse in my mind. I will not let you go until you bless me. I wanted to wrestle with God. I wanted to wrestle with the holy. I wanted to experience that which I had been preaching about and teaching about for my whole life. And it turns out that that's exactly what happened. God answered my prayer, but not in a way that I would expect. It didn't happen within the confines of Christianity. Um, I came to experience the holy. I came to experience God through quite a different way, uh, through the ancient, ancient religion, probably the first religion that today we call shamanism. Um, I found God in the woods, and I found God in the energies of the earth. And uh, it changed me. I was going to stay here for one year, and that was uh, about 15 years ago. <laughs> I've been here ever since. Well, I think, um, not to be judgmental, but I think that Christians tend to forget that 
things like omnipresent and omnipotent. He's if if oh, God is yeah. omnipresent, that means he's <laughs> everywhere in everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a difference between God being there and us seeing it. Um, a lot of times, it takes a change of atmosphere. It takes a change of uh, of lifestyle. It takes a change, maybe even a geographical change, for us to uh, all of a sudden open our eyes and see the God who was there all along. And uh, uh, I have no doubt that for me, that was the path that I had to travel. I had to move out to the woods. I had to experience nature. And there in, uh, in nature, sometimes days go by when I don't see anybody. Uh, I, have, I got a story I just have to tell you because it's you, kind of... You, a, haven't, you haven't told us the first experience yet. Oh, I will. I'll, I'll get to it. But before I forget, I, I ought to All tell right, you. Go ahead. I was uh, asked by a group of uh, people in Cornwall in... Uh, uh, to come over, uh, go over in England and 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 speak to them about the the uh, beginning of uh, beginnings of religion, the shamanic component at the root, which I believe is at the root of every world religion. Right. And I I had never been to England before, but my ancestors, my great 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 whatever, lived in a little town called F uh, Fenny Compton, which is up northwest of uh, England, um, of London. And uh, so when I was out there, I finished. I had a wonderful time in Cornwall with some really great people. And then I uh, rented a car and learned how to drive on the wrong side of the street and the wrong side of the car. And I drove up to this little town called Fenny Compton, where my ancestors used to preach. They were uh, ministers, clergy in the Church of England. And uh, I met the historian in the town who was a wonderful lady. She took me into the church and I was able to stand in the pulpit where my ancestor, my great, 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 however many greats grandfather used to preach every Sunday. And while I was standing in the pulpit, in the very pulpit he used to preach from, in the very church where he used to preach, I looked at the stained glass windows, which were the same stained glass windows that were there when he was preaching. And uh, lo and behold, the window that you could see best from the pulpit showed a depiction of Jacob wrestling with God, saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. How those uh, spiritual genes were passed on, I don't know, but somehow I got them. So at any rate, I, I came out here in the woods and started doing all kinds of things I'd never before done before. I started to learn how to, to douse, for instance, and I discovered earth energies. And one night... Um, you know, we may be out in the woods, but we're not totally primitive. There's a hot tub out in back of our little house, little chalet. And uh, we were sitting in the hot tub. And I was just kind of drifting off listening to some music we had going. And uh, I I thought I had fallen asleep. But I came, I came, you know, I looked at my wife and she was looking at me like, man, I was from outer space or something. And I said, what, what's wrong? And she said, don't you know what just happened? I said, no, no, what happened? And she said, you've just been talking, speaking. And I said, what? And it turns out that uh, I had uh, channeled this entity, and I had no idea what this was about. Uh, it scared me a little bit, but I was more excited than anything. We found out later that we had put the hot tub about a, uh, oh, 12, 15 feet from this enigmatic pile of uh, rocks that were piled up, quartz rocks mostly. And it was in a, a very specific location. And uh, having discovered a lot more of these rock piles over the years through the woods around us, we decided to excavate this one. And uh, we were not archaeologists, but we started taking the rock pile apart and seeing what we would find. And uh, the, the deeper we got, we got smaller and smaller rocks until we got down to this, uh, uh, not a bedrock, but a floor of what is called lithic debitage, or the stuff that's left over after a, uh, a stone worker, an ancient stone worker, would chip his stones. And we found all kinds of artifacts there, too. And we began to find other artifacts. And it turns out, make a long story short, um, that this rock pile was very probably the place where an ancient worker in stone, an ancient stone napper, worked. And uh, I have come to believe that the one who worked there was the very Sabuko, who later became my spirit guide. And uh, uh, his spirit still somehow inhabited the place and still lived on. 
Now you got to understand, man. I, I I was a Christian preacher, but I was a left brain theologian, and I was a college professor. But uh, I used to teach about world religions and all. But I never believed in any of this stuff. I, I was a, a a total disbeliever in all and uh, other dimensions and uh, all this kind of stuff. Um, and yet, there it was. It was happening to me. And as the years went by. I began to understand more and more of, that we are not our bodies. And as the quiet began to envelop me over the years, and I began to get out of the rat race and out of the noise and the confusion, and I had more time to myself, lo and behold, I discovered that uh, I was uh, really living on, in, in, in two different, on two different planes here in the material world but also in a, a, a spiritual world, a different dimension that uh, I can't fully understand, but I'm finding that scientists are, are understanding it more and more. They, they call it the quantum field. And more and more, as, they, as I, I began to study uh, quantum theory and, and quantum reality, I began to find a tremendous resonance with the ancient, ancient uh, Hindu religions, and the ancient rishis of, of India who began to talk in a different language, but they seem to be describing the very same thing intuitively that modern science is discovering through the use of complicated mathematics and formulas. And I became um, convinced that this world in which we live is, is really not the basis of the bedrock reality, but it is instead a... Um, in, in one sense, it's an illusion. Oh, the old thing, row, row, row your boat. Life is but a dream. Uh, we are experiencing a material reality that uh, I've discovered is very, very real. And uh, if we can open ourselves to it, and I think you were right, absolutely right, Mike, when you said you can find, find it anywhere. I happen to have gone the hard way around to come out here in the woods to live to find it. But uh, it, it, it worked. It was what I needed to find. And uh, I discovered eventually over the years, I discovered purpose and I discovered meaning. And uh, it just totally, totally changed my life. Um, the first time I was ever consciously out of body, I had tried for a long time to have an out of body experience. I'd done a lot of reading about it. And I went up to uh, North Carolina and uh, studied with Bill Buhlman, who I think is probably one of the finest uh, teachers in the world today about uh, out-of-body experiences. I studied with him for a week up at the Monroe Institute and uh, discovered that, well, Bill used to say that you have to make it a first importance in your life. You just can't luck into it or find your way into it. And so he said that if you use some of his techniques, and with me it was meditation, uh, other people have used other techniques. I don't have anything against uh, uh, mushrooms or ayahuasca or LSD or any of that. I just don't have any experience with any of that. But a lot of shamans have used that, drumming and other things. But if through meditation, he, he said, if you spend 30 minutes a day for 30 days, uh, you will have an out-of-body experience. And so I made it first in my life. I found a time during the day, and for me, that was as strange as it is to say, 3 o'clock in the morning. I uh, always was awake at 3 o'clock in the morning, so I'd get up out of bed and I'd go and I, I would meditate. And uh, it it took almost those that 30 days. If I had quit after 28 days, I would never have had my first out-of-body experience. But uh, on the 29th day, sure enough, something shifted. I found myself experiencing a different reality. And uh, at first, as I talk about in the book, um, it, it, it's, it, it shocks you so much that it's nine out of 10 times. And since then, I've talked to a lot of people and uh, had a lot of people question me and, and, and tell me their experiences. Uh, when it happens the first time, it's very easy to, for it to shock you so much that all of a sudden you find yourself right back in your body again. But after a while, you get more used to it. You get contented and you find the peace and that one point meditation, which is so important. And uh, lo and behold, it, it doesn't happen every time. Matter of fact, it probably doesn't even happen most of the time. But on a fairly regular basis, uh, you can leave this body and experience a reality that is 
oh, in one sense so far away, in another sense closer than we can imagine. Well, tell us the actual experience the very first time you got out. At, what exactly happened? I met I met Sabuko. I met my uh, my ancestor, my my well my I think my ancestor, but also my other half. I've come to believe that Sabuko, this ancient stone worker who lived here on this piece of property, um, is in a sense my other half. He's the half that I left behind when I made the decision, as all of us do, to come here and experience material reality. Um, he came to me in the sense of, of, of uh, an ancient Indian. Uh, I can't tell you really what he looked like. I just had that sense of ancient Native American. Uh, I can't even tell you what he was wearing. Um, but since then, uh, we've been in daily contact, and not only through out-of-body experience, but also through my dowsing rods and uh, answering yes and no questions and that kind of thing. And in a sense... Uh, I felt welcome. I, I felt like I had stepped out of this body. And when I stepped out of this body, I left all the worry and all the anxiety and all the pain behind and all of the doubt and all of the fear. And instead, I found only a sense of warmth and compassion and and, and love, uh, joyous love. Um, the feeling that uh, when we leave here and when we die, and I've had the experience of as being a minister, of being with oh, dozens and dozens of people as they died, some of whom came back after and told me about it, uh, the same sense of reality, you, uh, you, it somehow seems more real there than here. And as a result, I not only have no fear of death, I'm actually looking forward to it. I don't mean to say that in a morbid way, but in a real joyous way, that there is something wonderful waiting us because we are going back to what we were in, 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 in that sense. So have you considered writing a book about the knowledge you've gotten from the people who came back after they died? Yeah, yeah, I've included some of that in this book that isn't done yet. The, the book that's coming out uh, that my daughter and I are bringing out in a couple of uh, couple of months is called Sabuko and Me. And um, I, I express in that book a, a real sense of regret in some ways. Um, as a minister, I was supposed to be there to help people pass over, to help people uh, um get ready for what's coming next. Uh, one of my favorite stories is also one of my stories of which I'm most ashamed. Um, I had a, a parishioner who uh, was older than me, and he was just a, a classic kind of everyman. I mean, he, he not only had two doctorates, a PhDs, in two different subjects, he had, be, he had started a university, which is still going now today. And he was a churchman. He was a member of the deacon board. He was a pillar of the community. Everybody liked him. I got a call in the middle of the night, uh, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, from a nurse who said, uh, Pastor Willis, your, your parishioner, and told me who it was, is in the hospital. He's not expected to get through the night. Can you come and see him? He's asking for you. And I said, of course. So I got up out of bed and put on my clothes, got in my car and drove to the hospital. And I went up and uh, I stood there by his bed. And, um, I, 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 you know, he, he and I were friendly enough where it was obvious he was hooked up to tubes and everything else. And it was obvious he wasn't going to make it too much more, too much later. And he and I were friends enough where I could say to him, um, Bradley, are you, are you ready to go? Are you ready to cross over? And he started crying. And he said, Jim, uh, I've done a lot of things in life, and I'm very proud of many of the things that I've done, but I haven't done the one thing that's most important. And I said, well, what's that? He said, I haven't prepared for this moment. And so we sat there and talked, and uh, luckily he made it through the night, and he made it through 10 more nights. Uh, the next 10 days, I spent a little of every single day with him. Um, but if anyone was seemed to be have had lived a contented and and good life it was this man but he hadn't prepared um kind of reminds me of the uh, i think it was mark twain once said that uh, 
most men die at the age of 27, but we don't bury them until they're 72. <laughs> and I think that was probably true of me and probably true of a lot of the people I know. We we just put off thinking about this. We put off preparing for death. We put off what it is. Uh, we put off what uh, is so important. And uh, I had done it myself. Um, when I look back at my my life, um, and I think of the people that I've been with in the hospital, for instance, and some who have died or crossed over and then come back. And they tell me about seeing people at the at the end of the bed. They tell me about seeing entities or seeing people of light and asking me who I was standing with when I was all alone in the room. Well, I hate to say this. I'm very ashamed of myself. But back then, I really didn't believe in this stuff. I preached it. And my theology said that angels exist and that guardian helpers exist and all that kind of stuff. But I, I thought it was probably could be explained by some kind of brain chemistry or something. Now I look back and I, oh, I wish I had talked more to those people because as it turns out, uh, they would have had so much to teach me. I don't know whether I was able to help many of those people. I do know that they were able to help me a lot. And uh, as a result, um, I'm I'm absolutely sure that this is a very quick life that we lead here. We're here for a purpose. We're here to experience um, a school, so to speak, of what it is to live out in, in, in separation. And when we go back, we're going back to what we always were and always will be. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, so how many times would you say you've been out of your body and this, that you remember in your, in your current life? Oh, oh, I, I couldn't even tell you. I used to hundred keep, thousand. Oh, a hundred anyway, more than a hundred probably, but it's been over a course of, of uh, oh must must be much more than a hundred because it's been over the course of ten or twelve years and uh, um, I can't it will probably closer to a thousand I guess when you stop to think about it in that way. Well, okay. So book, say his name again. Sobuko. Sobuko. Yeah, and and I had no idea whether that's really his dad. That's the name that was in my head, so that's the name I gave him. Uh, well, I don't. It sounds I, I've, Japanese. I've, I've, it doesn't sound. Different. Yeah, it does. I've 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 uh, I've looked it up. I've tried to find it, uh, but it's I I can't find any meaning for it. And like I say, that may not be his name. That may be the name that I needed, and it was in my head when I first thought about it, and so it's just always been there. Um. So you said you, you've never had anything bad happen to you when you got out of your body. Have you well, that's ever not, been frightened? That's not quite, not quite true now. Uh, I wrote in the book <laughs> that I, a lot of times people will say, aren't you worried about bad things that can happen? Aren't you worried about demons or bad entities or bad angels or whatever? And I always assure everybody, no, 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 it's not like that. I never had one bad experience. I wrote that down in the book. And uh, within a day or two, I had my first bad out of body experience. Uh, I can't say that it was evil. I think I was, I, I think I have been protected as almost all of us are that's one of the reasons that we're met on the other side by by entities i think i can't say that it was evil i think i've been protected from that but it was just very uncomfortable and it was very dark and it was very troubling i kind of equate it to the fact that sometimes we can have wonderful dreams at night when we're sleeping and we don't want to wake up sometimes we can have nightmares and the nightmares seem just as real if not even more real than the dreams and so uh, I think probably out-of-body experiences are that yeah. as long as we have one foot in this materialistic world, we are in a world of duality. And uh, that means you can't come across good without its opposite. And so I think you're going to find it. Uh, you're going to find comfortable warmth and acceptance. And uh, also sometimes you're going to find uh, uncomfortableness and uh you're going to wonder, where am I? Uh, what am I doing? Uh, you know, what's happening to me? And that kind of thing. And the trick is, you just you just have to go with it. Uh, you you 
you have to try not to think it too much because you can't think your way out of body. You can't, you know, meditation is not focusing your thoughts. It's it's opening yourself up. So do you mind talking about the negative experience? What, what happened? Uh, it was it was very dark, and there was a, an entity uh, across uh, out in back of my my uh, place where I meditate in, in my house, and where we built a medicine wheel. There's a there's a stream, and on the other side of the stream there was a, a very unpleasant um, entity that uh, seemed to be watching me and waiting for me, and I was very repelled by him. Um, come to think of it, I had I had one other experience that was uncomfortable like this. Um, I, I I I write about it in the book about meeting uh, a woman who took me down into uh, underground into a, a cave like thing that turned out to be kind of a well it was like a a, a underground room or cell of some kind. And the, there, there was a door that opened up uh, that we went into. And, and she said to me, this is where I have to live when you die. And I came to understand that this woman was uh, in the, my ego. Um, I had never pictured my ego in, in the feminine before. But it, I realized how much of our ego really controls us in a sense um, every single one of us can be very easily and mostly are uh, possessed by a demon. And the demon is a, a creation of our own. It's called our own ego. That is a wonderful thing because it gives us our sense of individuality, but it also can be a very uh, a dangerous thing in the sense that the ego is the sense of of I. It's The ego is the one who talks when he says, I have a heart, I have a brain, I have a this, I have a that, I have a soul. And the ego is the I that says all those things. Um, and yet, uh, it, it, it the ego is also, becomes very much aware of the fact that when we die, we lose our sense of ego, we lose our sense of self, we no longer have a material body. And the ego knows that its time is short. The ego knows that when we die, the ego is dead. Um, and uh, if we're not careful, and if we not keep our ego in the right place, and keep it in a sense of balance, it it can become a pretty pretty scary thing. So, what happened with the? Uh... The being that was unpleasant that was watching you. How did that event end? Well, I I kind of retreated from it, but I had the feeling that I wasn't alone and that I wasn't facing it by myself. Um, it could be, perhaps, that the being that was unpleasant, it could have been, uh, uh, I could have conjured it up from the parts of myself that are unpleasant. In other words, it could have been my dark side, so to speak. That's kind of the feeling I was left with. But it's awfully hard to explain these things with English because English was invented to explain experiences that happen on this side of the uh, of our sensory fence. And uh, when we go out of body, we're actually going out in into um, an area that's uh, not enclosed by that sensory fence of of uh, taste and touch and hearing and smell and sight and as a result we experience things that it's it's kind of hard so when we come back and we try to describe them it's like uh, the brain has to go through our little rolodex of experiences until it finds something we can't actually say what i experienced was this all we can do is say what i experienced was like this and uh so it's it's very hard to take an out of body experience and put it into words, just like it's hard to wake up from a, a vivid dream and describe exactly what was in the dream. So when you get out of your body, um, is uh, in your book a, a lot of your book has to do with um, the place that you've been drawn to that you live now and mm -hmm. the yeah. The Indians who 
live there before you mm -hmm. and um but um okay so when the beyond uh what where we are now in our bodies well where we came from if you talk to people who the end years and uh, the people who know about their pre-birth experiences yeah. and um, and all of that stuff. People say, you know, you you go to a very positive place. Most of them, not all of them, say that. But um, but I I suspect that that's distinctly different from where you go when you get out of your body. And because, you, you know, you're still here or you're still in yeah, yeah. a space which is not that. So if you had to give it a name, obviously you would probably say that's the astral space. Uh, not is, not really. Not? That's, that's why I call it the quantum Akashic field. Um, I don't think it's all subjective. I, I think it has a basis in reality. It has a basis in science. The experience itself is uh, very old. We can go back in the Bible and we can find uh, Isaiah, uh, Elijah, uh, the Apostle Paul. They all talk about out-of-body experiences. Uh, I, I think that the, the first shamans who crawled back into those underground caves of Eastern Europe uh, at least 40,000 years ago, and now some people are saying it's much, much older than that, I, we wonder about why did they do it? Why did they crawl back underground and paint those pictures? I think what they were trying to do was paint the reality of what they saw in out-of-body experiences. I think that was the very birth of what we now call religion. Uh, well, I'm more comfortable with the word spirituality, but I think these early, early shamans through some medium that we don't understand, uh, perhaps it was mushrooms, perhaps it was drumming, uh, perhaps it was a combination of plants that expanded their their minds. Uh, they experienced something, and they couldn't they couldn't describe it. So they went back way underground into the womb of the earth, and they painted it. and And I think that's probably the answer to many of these great paintings that we see. Uh, and so nowadays we're understanding uh, through science and and through quantum reality that. Even what we call material reality, these bodies which seem so solid, this life which seems so solid, this material existence that surrounds us that seems so solid, the deeper you go, the more layers of the onion you peel off, the less you find until eventually you get down to, to nothing. It's just pixels on the screen. And uh, I think that's probably uh, uh, the fact that modern scientists are beginning to find through mathematics and through scientific uh, principles, that which the early shamans knew a long time ago, except they knew it intuitively. And now we're trying to explain it and find it intellectually. Uh, the place where you go, I, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I, I sound I, reluctant not, to give it a name. Well, yeah, I hate to call it a place because in, in effect, uh, the word place describes a reality that we're used to here. Uh, and I think it's a it's well, a pl it's a place of no place. It's everywhere. It's it's connected. It's entangled. Uh, all of those I'm, words that you hear. I'm not saying it's static. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying at all. But yeah. it's obviously a fluid place. And yeah. I guess what I'm going to do instead of trying to lock you down to a name, <laughs> I'm going to go to the opposite end of the scale from where we just came from. Uh, so if the entity you saw, which you think might have been your your dark side or wh whatever that was, uh, that was your, one of your two negative experiences. Tell me, can you remember your most positive experience? Yeah. Um, I remember it in the sense that it isn't just an, an experience, but it's many experiences. When you get uh, out of body and you know you're out of body, but by now you're experienced enough and calm enough not to treat it as a, uh, a big deal, not to get too excited about it, when you just accept it. I can't tell you how many times 
I have come to understand that it's time to go back and I don't want to. I wanted to just stay. Uh, it's because it's it's so beautiful. Uh, you can't describe the colors. You can't describe the sounds. Um, they're just too vivid for words. You can't describe any of that. And I don't know how many times it was. It's with great reluctance. I realized that for some reason it was time to go back. Time time to come back into the body. And then you would wake up. And the first the first experience after something like that is always, oh, I'm back. <laughs> you don't want to come back. Uh, I've so they're all very positive. Everyone, every yeah, most, every experience you've ever had is very positive. Usually, just about every single one of them. I, I can't think of any that weren't positive, except for the two that I mentioned. And even those were positive in the sense that they did teach me something. Uh, uh, but I, I've heard so many people. Uh, I've, I've read their stories, and I've talked to dozens, as I say, of people who were clinically dead and had near-death experiences and then came back into the body. And they all say the same thing. I didn't want to come back, but I had to. A lot of times they tell me they had to make a choice and uh, they knew the right choice. They knew they had to come back, but they really didn't want to. So it sounds like um, even though the, the out-of-body experience is not the same as the afterlife experience, it sounds like a very slightly dull facsimile when i say slightly dull i mean it's it's also extremely positive but the when they talk about the afterlife they're talking like off the charts uh, yeah. positive well you know, there's uh, you know you hate to say this because i i don't want to disparage anybody at all but there's a lot of quacks out there in this field too, just like every other field, you know, there are people you, you can go on YouTube and you can find all these people who put on the spooky music and get on the weird voice and talk like this and everything. And they tell you what it's like and all that kind of stuff. I, I don't, I don't pay a lot of attention to that uh, because I think everybody's experience is probably different. I mean, I know what I experienced, but I've had many, many people tell me other things, some stories that I find very difficult to believe. But, um, and like I say, YouTube is full of them. You can, you can just find all kinds of that. So do you, but, do you but, have a, um, do you have somebody in the field other than yourself that you think is, um, I mean, it, when you went to the Monroe Institute, which I, I used to live fairly close to there, I was yeah, all yeah. within within two hours of driving distance. Yeah, there. And I, I never went. I didn't have the money to go. You know, I, I could have gone, but my I got a wife. You know, <laughs> um, it didn't work for you. But then you were able to do it without the. Yeah, I I think I went there uh, trying too hard. You know, I don't think it was their fault. It was my fault. Uh, I went there with expectation, and uh, I, I went there expecting to have an out-of-body experience. And you know, I flirted with it when I was there, but it it didn't it didn't work for me. Probably not only was I trying too hard, but uh, I also have a hard time. Uh, I'm not a group-oriented type person, and there were a lot of different people all telling different stories, and some of them were really fantastic, and you just didn't know if, how much of it was just you know, imaginary, how much of it we make up, how much of it was due to self-hypnotism and all this kind of stuff. And so I found those two aspects of myself, the skeptical part and the part that was trying too hard. Uh, but I sure, you know, I sure can't help but recommend it to anybody who is thinking about going. Monroe Institute has got a wonderful uh, reputation over a long period of time and I, I can't say enough about bill uh, bill buhlman either william buhlman um he is just a wonderful teacher he's not part of the monroe institute he's not officially a part of it but he he teaches there they invite him to come in three or four times a year and do week-long workshops there and he does he does a wonderful job and it'll certainly get you going. And there are people, I'm sure, who might listen to this, who might want to look up Monroe Institute and uh, and consider going for their opening course. It's 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 really well worth it. So, um, you mentioned there's a a page on in your book towards the end that lists all the things that you feel 
are important to do. And I and you mentioned one of them just a few minutes ago. You said, you know, you have to do, you have to um, meditate or focus for every day for 30 days. And yeah. like, that's what he told you. Yeah. And it, it turned out to be true for you. Yeah. So short of, aside from stick to itiveness or stubbornness or whatever you want to call it, yeah. uh, or making the time and uh, meditation, is there something in particular within the meditation or some, is there something you've found over your years that uh, stands out as being the secret as in, well, let's say you stop the mind and you do, you know, you know what I'm saying? Is well, there something yeah, particular yeah. which always uh, works for you or works for you more times than not? More times than not, I'm, I, I'm using uh, hemisync music, listening to hemisync music. Uh, hemisync is, is, uh, was invented by Robert Monroe, the founder of Monroe Institute. And uh, his specialty was uh, radio and sound engineering. And he developed a, a system of, of music that, uh, well, it's it's kind of a complicated thing to explain, uh, especially you know, to people who are not familiar with it. But basically, you might say it, it tends to synchronize the two hemispheres of the brain, and uh, it, it it tends to uh, focus your 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 mind because uh, generally most of us here in the Western world what we try to do is think our way, you know, we, we reason our way and we're thinking, okay, I will slow down my mind or I will do this or I will do that. Some people are more comfortable using a, a mantra of some kind, uh, anything to get your mind away from that constant monkey brain that's going on in our heads. Um, some so, people, yeah, I, I, the, the basic problem is that we are so left brain oriented. We think our way through everything. Right. And that's the problem. Uh, we're thinking all the time. Um, and the trick is to find some way that will bring you down and, and all of a sudden your brain stops doing all that thinking. A lot of people find it accidentally. Uh, they may be half asleep and half awake. Uh, and their body is pretty much asleep, but their mind is drifted down. All of a sudden, some something will happen. I've had a lot of people tell me this. Something happens where all of a sudden by accident they found themselves thrown out of body and and uh, you know I, I I don't think anymore we have to look upon this stuff as strictly mystical I, I think we're talking about a a a real reality here uh, scientists all over the place are talking about other realities other dimensions that are closer than we can imagine and uh, uh, those other realities are right there, and we're trying to get there, and I think maybe sometimes they're trying to get here too. Um, the funny part about this is one of the hardest communities that I have to talk to is the Christian community, because this is very verboten in most Christian <laughs> communities, you know, talk about out-of-body experiences, sure. entities. And yet, at Christmas time, we just came through a time period when Christians all over the world stood up and they sing songs like... Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth, or hark the herald angels sing glory to the... They're talking about a group of other entities who step out of another dimension uh, and and sing or speak to us in, in vibrational ways, and music is is vibration. And so they're, in other words, they're, they're putting this great uh, song... Uh, you know, singing these great heartfelt songs about that which they say they don't believe in, <laughs> um, and I, I, I think there is a reason for it. I, I, you know, angels are just think about them as entities from another dimension who step into this dimension with a message. That's what shamanism is. It, it, uh, a shaman doesn't just do this to get a thrill. He, for, it's for a reason. The shaman goes into another dimension, and there he receives information usually of a healing nature or something of that, and he comes back and 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 heals his patients with that. I mean it's a it's it's a reason. It's it's a going out there to receive information that we need and then coming back. And human history is full of people who have had experiences like that. 
Um, I think probably most anybody listening to my voice right now has had an out-of-body experience but just doesn't consider it such. Usually it's in a dream at night, a dream that seems especially vivid or especially uh, use, you know, useful. And uh, you come back or um, uh, scientists will talk, you know, everybody from – Thomas Edison to Einstein. We'll talk about thinking, thinking through, through a problem, trying to figure it out, trying to figure it out. And then all of a sudden they let go and they say, I'm not going to think about it anymore. Boom. Aha. The moment comes. And all of a sudden they experience the, the answer to what they were trying to reason their way to. And it didn't come through reason. It just came through from somewhere. Uh, why is a, uh, a Mozart able to do what Mozart is able to do. Why is a Bach able to do what Bach can do? Um, I was a musician. I studied music at Eastman, and I studied Bach uh, contrapuntal technique for two years. And I know all of the rules. I can follow all of his rules and write a, a Bach, uh, qu uh, you know, motet or something like that, just like Bach would do. But my my music doesn't sound like him. Why? It's because he's in touch with something that's bigger than us, something from the outside. Same thing with art. You know, a lot of people can paint, but all of a sudden something happens where something steps through and you say, aha. Uh, we even talk about it in popular music. I, I'm old enough to remember the old rock and roll song, you know, give me the beat boys and soothe my soul. I want to get lost in your rock and roll and drift away. Uh, that's a shamanic experience, you know, losing yourself in, in the rhythm uh, and all of that. It's, it's, I, 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 I think we have to be careful about not, not making something too mystical that is in reality a, a, a very real experience of what it is to be a human. Well, okay, so um, the hemisync, hemispheric synchronization technology which is freely available yeah on on uh you can pay for it through amazon or you can get it for free through youtube yeah, sure okay and there's some of it you can't get for free like the gateway experience which you yeah. can buy yeah but uh if you look at all the hemisync um recordings that you can listen to for free you've got a plethora of different mind um levels that they that they uh make the music for or they're focusing yeah. on now yeah. some of them like delta and theta we know those are sleep motivated or you know if you listen to delta you're going to go to sleep if you listen to theta you're also likely to go to sleep if you listen to beta you're going to be wide awake if you listen to alpha you'll relax yeah. and so forth and so on but um, most people don't know about gamma, which is above beta. That's your no mind. So uh, you said that your one of your secrets is listening to him and sync music. The yeah. question is, uh, which particular level of mind state to the music that you listen to focus on? What, what is it? What level are the frequencies that you listen to in particular? To be honest, I don't have the faintest idea. I I, I go with what works uh, for about, oh, maybe 14, 15 years now. I've listened to one particular CD over and over and over again um, called Sleeping Through the Rain. And uh, it's very famous. A lot of people have heard it, used it. It works for me. And so I use it a Who's, lot. Of, did it? Uh, uh, it's it's well, I got it up at uh, up at uh, I, I can't even think of I can't even tell you who 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 recorded it. Uh, I have tried since then. I have a, a surround sound system in the house that I built out here in the woods. And I've tried a lot of different YouTube things and uh, some of them work, some of them don't. Uh, so, but the ones that work, I tend to go back to the ones that don't, I tend to leave. Um, uh, part of my problem is that I'm a musician 
and and uh, uh, there's some I don't want to listen to just because I don't like the music, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I I I just try a lot of stuff and, and use what works. But I keep going back to sleeping through the rain over and over and over again. Do you remember just, where uh, you got it? I got it up at uh, up uh, at Monroe Institute. Um, we would follow the same pattern up there. We would have a lecture, and we would have talks, and then we'd all go into our little cubicles there, and they would play music. And this particular one, I, I really latched onto it, and I asked afterwards, I asked Bill, what was that? And he told me. So I went over to the bookstore, and I bought it over there, and I brought it home, and I've been using it ever since. Um, so... When people die, uh, even if it's just for, you know, a few minutes and they say, well, I was over there for like a year and it, well, yeah, on this side yeah. it was only three or four minutes. Yeah. Uh, I, I ran into a guy in Walmart and he um, he told me he'd spent the last 20 years taking care of his uh, father who was um, totally... Um, not able to, basically he was totally almost dead. They yeah. both died in a car accident, right, yeah. together. One of them got paralyzed, that was the father. The son died, he went to the other side. And so I asked him a series of questions. The very first question I asked him was, uh, please describe the other side. And he literally could not put yeah. out one single sentence. He couldn't put yeah. out a whole sentence. Describing the other side, I said, okay, you can't describe it. Fine, I understand that. Did, did it change you? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, how did it change you? He said, well, I um, I don't worry about the future. And I don't think about the past. I live in the present. So I suspect that getting out of your body has changed you yeah. in something, maybe not exactly the same way, but in similar or some type of fashion, in a dramatic way, a big way. Yeah. So what what has changed since your first one, and what has changed? What if anything, over the many years you've done it, has anything changed over the years different from after the first one? That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one big changes i was a i was a christian minister for 40 years i've been to church every single sunday of my life unless i was really sick ever since i was born my family went to church every single sunday uh i haven't set foot inside a christian church or any church for uh, 15 years now um i just it it hasn't worked for me and i'm not saying that that's, it's wrong i mean i'm not saying that people shouldn't go to church or the church is bad i'm just saying that for me there was just too much baggage associated with it uh for me i have to find it i have to find my spirituality alone uh i have to find it in in, in solitude now that's that's just me other people may have different totally different ideas but um uh, that's a that's a big change. Uh, my uh, spiritual belief is no longer tied down to a system. I still call myself a Christian, but uh, I think about Christianity in totally different ways. And I'm sure most Christians will probably think I'm not a Christian anymore. But um, I'm still listed in the book. It's still Reverend James Willis, so <laughs> and uh, all that. But for me, uh, uh, it has just been totally freeing in that regard. And the other big thing, it, it's a sense of of purpose, a sense of who we are and why we're here. Uh, I always struggled with that. I've developed, uh, I, I talk about this in the book a little bit. Uh, I go into it a lot more detail in other books that I've written. But uh, I, I talk about this um, pattern or a system that works for me that I call a slice of reality. And I try to describe what human beings are with this. Um, it's it's crude, but maybe it'll help somebody. It's helped me. Think of yourself uh, th as 
being in 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 what I like to call the source. I don't like I'm not comfortable with the word God very much because God has too much baggage. When I use the word God, people think I mean what they think when they hear the word God, and that may not be what I'm thinking at all. So I like to use the word source. Um, I, I like to picture it as a, 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 a oh a pie a round pie. And the source is the very center. Or picture it as the old. Uh, uh, vinyl records going around on a turntable you know in the very middle there's uh stillness there's uh no movement uh it's perfect unity perfect oneness uh, scientists use the word entanglement uh there was the source there was the place where we were all entangled we were we were together in one and it's it's a perfect it's a place of perfect peace of perfect love perfect light uh, just perfection. The trouble is, there's one thing that you can't do when you're in perfect unity and perfect peace, and that's experience individuality. Individuality doesn't exist. So you have to move out if you're going to experience uh, reality. Now think of the source if you want to think about it as the word God or Brahman or uh, Manitou or whatever. Um, how does the source experience what it is to not be in perfect unity? Uh, the only way is to leave. And so we make a courageous decision, I think, uh, all of us, to leave that source. And we enter into the first field, uh, not, not the first field, the first reality outside the source. It's called consciousness. Uh, both uh, Albert Einstein and uh, uh, Stephen, uh, um, uh, oh, you know, great physicist, trouble being 77. Uh, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking. Uh, they, they both refer to it as the mind of God. Uh, you're not an individual yet, but you're in what well, mind. You're in, in the area of thought. But to get any further out, you have to go through what the first field, and that's what I call the Akashic field. The Akashic field is the field of potential, the field of possibility. Uh, Plato referred to it uh, when he um, talked about horseness versus horse. You know, the horse is only a temporary manifestation. Horseness is what the horse manifests. Um, horseness is eternal. Horse is just a temporary manifestation that dies. It's the Akashic field is that field of potential. Uh, this is the field uh, that's the word Akashic is being used more and more now because it's the ancient Sanskrit, uh, which really describes the same field, but they described it six, seven thousand years ago. And there in the field of potential, you still haven't reached individuality, but you have an idea of what individuality can be. So when you go through the Akashic field, you slow down, so to speak, a little bit. Or maybe you speed up. Maybe that's a better way to put it. I don't know. But you enter into the second dimension, the dimension that I call quantum reality, or the dimension of thoughts and intentions. You still don't know... Uh, you're still not a human being, for instance, an individual human being, but you know that what a human individual being can be. In order to get from quantum reality, though, into this material reality, you have to go through another field, and that's called the new. That's the newly discovered Higgs field. In the newly discovered Higgs field, which is just a very recent discovery from uh, Peter Higgs, uh, was was the one who eventually came up with the idea, but it was proven by the the uh, CERN particle collider. Uh, the Higgs field is where energy passes through the Higgs field and in effect, the Higgs boson there, it, it, it slows down. It, it takes on mass. Over here in America, they say it's like going through a field of molasses. Over in England, they talk about a field of treacle, whatever treacle is, I'm not sure. But when you go through that Higgs field, energy is converted into mass. Einstein gave us the equation for it, E equals mc squared. Energy is simply mass times the speed of light squared. Uh, energy and mass is the same thing, except we live in that material reality manifested. I call it the perception realm. That's where we live. Out here, we can experience individuality. 
out here we can experience not only love, but we can experience uh, hate. We can experience good and we can experience bad, cold and hot. It's a world of duality. And we're out here for that experience. And when that experience is over, and when this body uh, comes time to finish its task, it goes back through the Higgs field, back into quantum reality, back through the Akashic field, back through consciousness, back to the source. But it takes with it that experience that it learned in the school of our perception realm, of our material reality manifested. So in effect, we return to God. We always were source. We always were God, but we return to God. But in in effect, we, we come back. Uh, God somehow changes. Source somehow changes. It has now gained the experience of that which source can only talk about. Uh, th that's kind of what I pictured. As I said, it's it's a uh, kind of a crude way of saying it, but it works for me. It, it it says what my purpose is, and when I'm going through a dark night of the soul, or when I'm going through a a, a time of, of of sickness or pain, or going through these last three years where everything from economic collapse to COVID to war to uh, environmental catastrophe and political turmoil and all of this kind of stuff. I'm in the midst of all of that. I don't have to say, well, what's the purpose? Well, this idea gives me purpose. It says your, your purpose is to experience it, uh, to accept it. It's, it's part of what life is here. And we take it back with us. Uh, so, our job is to experience it. So you're saying that uh, getting out of your body is actually getting closer to the creator. Closer to what? To the creator. To the, to the I, I couldn't to understand. To God. That. To the creator. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To the creator. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I, I think maybe it's even. Uh, a, Perhaps that's why we sleep. Uh, perhaps we all have to get out of the body uh, just for our own sanity uh, and and dream uh, just just to be free. Uh, and I, I think getting out of the body is exactly that: getting closer to the Creator, getting closer to the Source. So you just mentioned dreaming, and I'm going to try and make this my last question, but I, I might have others. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, uh -huh. Um, because I know you wanted to limit our conversation somewhat, but um, how does dreaming? I mean, does your do you have more lucid dreams or less the same? More, normally more. Do? yeah. That's, hold on, that's... before you before you answer. Uh, also, like, um, how does dreaming? It, some people say that you actually go into the astral realm. Yeah. When you're dreaming, so that that's part of the question is, how do they compare? And secondly, are they the same? Are you really going into the Akashic field when you dream, or the astral field, or what astral realm, or however you want to put these things? Well, I uh, yeah, uh, that probably is one of the downsides of having out of body experiences is that your dreams do become more vivid. I've had dozens and dozens of people tell me that they become much more vivid and you recall them and the wonderful dreams are are fantastic but yeah the nightmares are can be pretty scary because it is basically dreams are recalling or bringing up to the surface all of the experiences that you have had out here and that your purpose for coming out here in this material reality manifested your purpose for coming out of the source and moving out here to the edge of our perception realm is to make these experiences to gain these experiences and i think as we dream we tend to sort them out and uh put them in a a, a kind of a well let's some people talk about the akashic record so to speak uh, the akashic library or whatever i i think they become a part of uh, reality. Uh, Stephen Hawking was very careful to say that uh, uh, energy cannot escape. Uh, it should change forms and in, in a, even in a black hole that you don't lose any information. It's there somewhere. And I tend to think of dreaming in that way. Uh, our dreams are manifested somehow within the Akashic field, within the Akashic record. 
and uh, sometimes those are good dreams, and sometimes they're bad dreams. So you've, it seems like uh, the Akashic field is very different from dreaming because in the Akashic field, you, you claim, and I don't have any reason to doubt you, that 98% of your experiences are positive. Well, obviously, if you look at people's dreams, 98% of yeah. yes. our yeah. dreams are yeah. not positive. It's Good much, point. the percentage <laughs> is very different. Here's, I guess, here's my last, try to make my last question. Is, um, do, and you said your dreams were more lucid than before. Do you feel that we actually go into the Akashic field or the astral plane, the same place that you go when you go out of body, do we sometimes go there in our dreams? Uh, yeah, with this caveat, we have to be really careful when we're talking about this because we talk, we're talking about going. We're talking about a place. Uh, and, the, and speaking of the Akashic field as if it's a place. And that's where it's so frustrating because we're right back to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, these words, go, uh, place, uh, being, uh, they all describe a material type manifestation and they i don't think they really work when we try to uh describe what it's like because i think the akashic uh field is is a, a place of no place uh and it's a it's a reality that we can't imagine because we can't picture reality without the manifestation of reality that's here in our perception realm with uh, atoms and and particles and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I, I think it's just kind of like looking at life through a microscope. You look at a, a body and you look at a cell and you look at an atom and pretty soon you're looking and there's nothing. <laughs> it's not there. It's no place, uh, no thing. Uh, and, and what do you do with that? You know, it, it's hard because we're trying to describe with human language that which really cannot be even comprehended, let alone described. Well, I, I heard people say that, and this is probably the truest thing I've heard about dreams, and it's not necessarily all dreams, but most dreams are just what you're doing is like on earth, you're, you've got a lot of negative experiences you go through and they may not be terribly negative but they're negative to you you perceive them as negative yeah yeah and so in dreaming you regurgitate that perception in your dream you're reflecting your your mirror uh whatever you experience here uh it comes in and then you release it when you're dreaming and it's yeah. it's a maybe it's two different mirrors but yeah uh, it's it, it is hard i um, uh, all I can say is look, look to the Bible. Here I am, the Christian minister. Uh, look at Ezekiel's vision. He had a vision of something that was real. He tried to describe it. Wheels within wheels and these fantastic, uh, four headed uh, beasts with animal bodies and, and four different heads, one of a, of a, an eagle and a lion and a man and a, a bear. And, uh, he, he tried his best. But you get the idea that he saw something that was a whole lot bigger than what he was talking about in the Old Testament. Same thing with the Apostle Paul. He says, uh, he, went, he went to heaven. He said, I, I saw things that I can't even talk about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, I saw things that I was not able to describe to you. Uh, he said, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. That's what he says in the Bible. And I think, you know, th this experience of... of uh, it it's probably a failing of humankind that when someone comes back from an out-of-body experience, we base our acceptance or rejection of that experience usually by how well they describe it. And uh, sometimes you can't do it. You just can't describe it. And so, uh, you know, reality... Is, is so much bigger. I think we have to be somehow open to uh, hear these stories and realize that all we're hearing is 
the, the person isn't saying this is what it was. The person was, is saying this is what it felt like to me when I was there. And that's a big difference. It's a big difference. I've heard people talk about, oh, the afterlife is full of trees and grass and green and all this kind of stuff. And, and I'm sure that's how they experienced it. But I don't think there's real, uh, you know, mystic trees in a place, someplace that waiting for us. I, I think that's just our our experience of it. That's all. Well, um, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Is uh, let me see if I can pull up real quick here. Your there we go. Uh, one second. So your website is www.jimwillis.net. And your Facebook is jimwillis.author. Right. And your YouTube is uh, slash C slash Jim Willis. Right. And um, aside from going through your website or Facebook or YouTube, is there any other avenues of seeking you out that you wish to reveal at this time well of course all the books are up on amazon too you can just you know put jim willis into amazon and you'll see all my books but sure if people want to reach me and i do like to talk to people the best way to do it is to go to my website jimwillis.net go to the contact page and uh write me an email i'd love to hear from you uh i'll i'll get it and i answer i answer every one of them that so far i've been able to do that uh, it's at the contact page. Just send me an email. Uh, and I'd, I'd love to hear it because, you know, you and I can talk and see each other on screens, but we have no idea who's listening. I'd like to know who's listening. So if you're listening, give me a holler. So you're in South Carolina. What's the nearest big city? Oh, probably Augusta. Augusta. How far are you from Augusta? Uh, Augusta, Georgia. I'm, oh, maybe 20 miles, something like that. And uh, is the... What kind of trees are around you? Oh, uh, pines? Mixed, mixed hardwoods and pines and spruce and yeah, love a whole it. bunch of different kinds. Yeah, love it, love it. Found a found a found a bear print on the path on the path the other day. <laughs> deer all a the fresh time. Fresh one? Yeah, yeah. Deer all the time. Uh, I think we had Not this it. warm warm weather and the the bear wanted to get up and get around a little bit. But uh, it's it's you know I I I don't advertise where I am because we are living on holy ground. Uh, we have discovered oh. we've we've discovered all kinds of artifacts of people lived here, uh, Indian arrowheads and and the scrapers and tools of various kinds. And uh, we built a, a medicine wheel and there's all kinds of rock piles in the woods that uh, we have looked at and discovered. Lo and behold, that they're built to mimic exactly uh, a certain constellation up in the sky called the Cygnus the Swan or the the Winter Cross. Uh, and we've, that that's not just our impression. We've actually, I actually had a surveyor, a friend of mine, come out with all of his high-tech gizmos and and uh, spot them on the ground with his uh, you know, G, GPS stuff and then go and put out a, 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 a chart for me of where these are and lo and behold, you can take the chart of all the rock piles and superimpose it over a uh, star chart of Cygnus the Swan and the, uh, the Northern Cross. And uh, they, they match exactly, uh, which just means that thousands of years ago, people were saying the old prayer, thy will on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> they want to bring the heavens down to earth. It's, it's really an amazing thing. So you found a place you feel totally comfortable in. Yeah, I'm not even sure I found it. I'm I'm really 90, 99% convinced we were led here for a reason. I think I've been here before in past lives, and um, I think there's a reason for it. I think Sabuko brought me back here. So Sabuko is your is your larger construct. I think so. I think so. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's where it all began. One time in an out of body experience, I said the words uh, that I have in the book. Um, oh. Uh, we have come full circle back to where it all began. Hawk will show the way with healing in his wings. Be content, all is well. And I think after many, many lifetimes, I've been brought back here. And uh, this is 
I've, I've come to believe this is probably my last time on earth. Uh, I, when I leave here, it'll probably be my last lifetime, and I'm on to other things. How many things. times do you think you've been here? Oh, I don't know. I think all of us have been here thousands of times, probably. Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I appreciate thank, your thank time. You, Mike. And, thank uh, you, Mike. I, I appreciate talking to you. This was This was fun. I hope you get more book sales, and I hope you... Uh, your life goes uh, as you wish it to be. And thank you. Works out. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you again. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Okay. Thank you, Mike.